Today we are present across 230 plus locations in the world. Uh, what we are doing basically is creating collaborative workspaces across the world for people to come and work with. So uh, we cater for all sorts of audiences from you know, single man startups, consultants, freelancers, right up to enterprise clients like Microsoft and you know, Salesforce and things like that. Uh, beyond the workspaces that you will see around you here, uh, this entire building, what we are trying to do is create a community of businesses that can work together. Because at the end of the day, startups or larger businesses as well need an ecosystem to work with each other and grow in. That is what we are trying to provide. And to enable that, what we do is events like this. Uh, you have a lot of different events happening through the week at every single WeWork location in the world, which as members, everyone gets access to. Beyond that, uh, you get access to the entire global footprint as well. So that's, that's more or less about WeWork. In Bangalore, this is the second building. We've just opened up Kormangla recently, and uh, we're scaling up and we're going to get really aggressive right here as well. So uh, I'll be around after the session as well, and uh, if any of you have any questions or want to see the facilities, please get in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, so just to quickly tell you guys a little bit about ADI. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of what ADI is. ADI is the Association of Designers of India. And um, it's, a, it's a professional body for designers. It, uh, the goal is to kind of bring together the overall community of designers in India. And we have a few chapters located in different cities uh, around the country. Uh, the Bangor uh, chapter is now sort of you know, gearing up to start off a whole series of events. We're going to be having uh, a series of monthly events uh, starting with this one. Uh, this is a part of a series called Offline. And there's a sub-category within that, which is Design Wars. And Design Wars is uh, 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 what we're calling our debate series, where we're just going to pick up like contentious topics within the design world and get people to just argue it out. Um, hopefully come to a compromise, maybe, who knows? You know? uh, but uh, um, that's, that's one part of it. And then there will also be, under the offline umbrella, we'll also be having uh, uh, talks and you know workshops and uh, present presentations and various things. Uh, so that's like a monthly series. Uh, if anyone is uh, interested in the ADI activities, you can just look us up online. Uh, I'll just uh, call our panelists and our moderator right now. Uh, I just want to welcome Arvind Lodera, our moderator. And, uh, and all our panelists from, from the Gen X side and the Millennial side, please come and join us on stage. And, uh, uh, I mean, after you, <laughs> you want to take it out right away. Go simple. Yes. You have the mics. Okay. So thank you everybody for being here. My name is Arvind, and uh, I've been nominated to moderate this discussion, but the way this is set up, because it's set up as a kind of fight between two generations, uh, let's not look for moderate, let's look for extremes. Um, and I think what is wonderful is that uh, people from the creative professions usually, if not always, uh, sort of have a lot of passion. And, uh, you know, life teaches us to sort of curb it down and to behave nicely and decently with each other. But here in this platform, my, my humble appeal to all of you and the panelists out here is let's put that aside for a while. Let's put decency and all that aside for a while. <laughs> and, and let's really let each other sort of have it. And the only condition is that you're authentic. Uh, that you really say what you feel, that you believe in, uh, but don't be afraid of, of saying it in a slightly rough way that might offend people's sensibilities. We're all sufficiently grown up here uh, to, to handle that with each other. <laughs> that too. In case that doesn't work, we'll sort of shunt you out on a stretcher. Right. Um, so let me start with this side, the millennial side. Why don't you introduce yourselves? Uh, hi, guys. I'm Arjun. I'm a designer. Lights on. Okay, hi guys. My name is Arjun. I'm a designer. Um, I run a design studio here in Bangalore. Um, we work with clients like uh, I don't know, Embassy, Stanford, uh, and a couple of other guys. So um, our studio is, in fact, just two buildings away. If you are in the neighborhood, drop by. I am Sarang. 
I am the editor in chief of Yanko Design with a website that covers uh, inspirational and innovative design content world over. And I formerly trained in industrial design, but then I kind of surrendered that to to I mean start writing about design, and that's what I do now. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Shankhalina Nath. Uh, my millennial design title is, I call myself a creative director, brand consultant, and graphic designer. Uh, don't know how much of it is fake, um, but whatever rocks the boat. So I am a visual designer. I primarily work with identities and uh, visual languages. And um, I mean, uh, just riding the wave of this new awareness of design that's happening everywhere in today's day and age. And that's about it. Hi, uh, my full name, unfortunately, is Shiva Kumar Vishwanathan, but you can call me Shiva. That's what I'm generally known as. I, um, I, I'm a UX consultant and a uh, brand consultant right now. Um, I used to work in, as a graphic designer. Uh, I, I, I think we did graphic design way before the computers were there, so eventually kind of moved to uh, user interface design, UX and brand. I used to head brand union in India before this and I was the digital lead for APAC and that's it. So. Uh, hi, my name is Rustam. Uh, I have a background in editorial design, uh, mostly in mass communication, but my first job, I've done two jobs. Presently I'm working at the Shishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology. I have no idea how I am an academic dean there. But uh, my first 12 years, I worked for a non-profit called Center for Science and Environment. It produced a magazine called Down to Earth. And it did a lot of research and advocacy uh, and communication work around environment development issues, science, environment, and development. So that uh, was my sort of formative years. It was not, in, not with designers. I was mostly uh, working. My colleagues were researchers and scientists and environmentalists and activists and things. Uh, and then the second half I've entered into design education. So that's been a steep new learning curve of having to deal with emotional landscapes of 17, 18, 19 year olds. Uh, my name is Poonam Beer Kasturi. I trained as an industrial designer and I am the eldest on this panel. Uh, I did design <laughs> when there were no computers at all. And <laughs> so technology and all what you guys think about technology. We had a different idea of technology. I've um, done many things, but right now I'm um, running a company called Daily Dump. So we get people to think about how they can relate to materials that they see and use every day and try and get them to become a little more aware that they're living on planet Earth and they should do something about it. Thank you. So a round of applause for the panelists, please. Okay. And let me quickly take a, so take some stock of the of the the audience that's turned up here, and we have a full house. All tickets sold out. So great job. Um, so the, I mean, I'm trying to just get a sense of the issues here. What would be the issues that we actually debate out here? Because let's not just make this just about fun and frolic, but let's also get to the bottom of something. So I'd like to ask you, uh, how many of you have had some kind of a well, not say, let's say a little unpleasant experience working with the other generation. If you belong to a senior generation, then it's of course the other one, other way around. And if you belong to the younger generation, then it's the other way around. How many of you would, you would feel that you've had something, some kind of an experience, which is not really happy in your, in your experience so far? Show of hands. Show of hands, yes. One, two, that's it. I must say, this is a very, very kind of cooperative and harmonious community. <laughs> We'll have to work really hard to find the divisions and fault lines, but we will get there, not to worry. Okay, um, um, that's, that's interesting. Also, I mean, in fact, let me put the question to you guys as well. I mean, how many of you have had uh, slightly friction kind of experiences with dealing with, the, with this generation? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good pain point to sort of come back to. I don't think that it's with the other generation. Okay. But uh, I think that uh, to a large extent, the kind of process and the kind of uh, thinking that they have, right, uh, stemmed from ideas, needs in the market from 70 years ago, 80 years ago. 
you know, uh, the market has changed, the economy has changed, the way people do business, the way people do uh, interact, the way people do anything, you know, for that matter, has... <laughs> Whatever, maybe. <laughs> So, uh, given that, I believe that uh, design also needs to change in terms of the kind of process, the way in which you interact, the way in which you actually make something, right, for that market. Yeah, but then so, we didn't cease to exist. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, now. okay, that's what you want to say. I mean, they're still managing, you know, yeah. give them credit for that, right? yeah. coping. Um, but but does, this, this, does this strike a chord, what he just said? That, you know, the, the realities of the world, of the marketplace, of, of the way things are done. Um, I mean, as he says that, you know, there's, he can perceive this gulf or this gap between people from another generation who basically approach it from a different, and the term maybe, as designers, we can use the term mental model. Uh, it suggests itself that maybe the mental model that, you know, people like me operate from and people like him operate from are substantially different. And, and it's important to acknowledge it. Uh, do you think so, from your own experience of work? Yes, no? Yes. Yes. Raise hands. Don't say yes, raise your hands. Okay, so that's good, because this gives us something to really build upon, this whole mental model, experiential worldview kind of a thing. So, um, um, let me start with a slightly kind of um, uh, interesting question, which perhaps would come from, uh, reflect this generation's perspective vis-a-vis -vis this generation. Um, and I, let me put it to, to you guys first, and then we can also have a round with the audience. Um, one, of the, one of the expectations or one of the stereotypes that, that, that people from my generation have about, about your generation is that there is a lot of unacknowledgement entitlement. You know, you guys have actually had a really, really good ride and, you know, people like us have sort of worked around or with a lot of issues to make life really good for you and, and you are completely unaware of it uh, and uh, not even sort of um, acknowledge its existence or its contribution to your own uh, fantastic sense of self-confidence and accomplishment. <laughs> what would you say? No, no, I will, I will stop Arjun from answering this for now. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, I would I'd, I'd counter that with a question about how it could have been easier for y'all because uh, you have this sort of honeymoon period with each with each uh, industry or with each occupation, and I think y'all lived that. Whereas we're fighting we're fighting for our existence because we're living in a time where. Uh, Every year, we've got 10,000 or 20,000 new uh, designers passing out. So it's a battle amongst ourselves. It's not really, I mean, we're trying to look, look at self-sustenance on a very small level. We're not looking at industry sustenance right now because, I mean, the industry can go to hell. We need to survive as well, right? So, okay. so you're saying it's that tough. Is, that, that is, a, I mean, that is, that is, that's, that's where I think my, uh, my problem exists, not Okay. Whether it, it's not really entitlement, it's it's me needing to prove myself when I've got like ten thousand other people I need to prove myself against. Okay. So what you what, what I'm hearing you saying is that it's not easy, as it it's might seem. Easy, yeah. It's tough, and you also have to struggle to establish yourself or find find your kind of place in the scheme of things. Is that right? Establishing myself is the problem. Is the problem. Whereas for you, it was establishing the industry. Okay. All right. So How about you? You have a take on this? Yeah, I do actually. Uh, so, um, uh, I would like to counter, not exactly counter, but uh, put forward a viewpoint, mm -hmm. let's say, which I feel belongs to my generation on that. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, again, uh, I am a visual designer, so um, uh, usually there are these two kind of questions that I generally, um, uh, not questions, but I get uh, judged by uh, uh, designers of older generation as to um, uh, when I go up they always ask me things like are you copy or creative are you print or digital are you this or that are you uh, specializing here specializing there and uh, somewhere I want to say uh, no I'm both I am uh, but then the question comes back saying no which are you primarily then uh, I want to say that um, Neither. I, I am both. I would. Uh, I don't look at design from this perspective. Um, I don't know whether I am coming across as an entitled individual, uh, claiming two, uh, let's say, um, uh, two sorts of, uh, uh, what do you say, streams, which are so uh, difficult on their own rights, and saying that, okay, no, I am not saying that I am the best at both, but I am pretty good at both, and I would like to approach the way I design 
uh, from a multi-directional approach. So this is where I feel that we, um, as millennials, may come off as entitled looking or um, uh, in our attitudes that we want to claim uh, so many different things and do everything at the same time. But like what Saran said over here, that we are in a completely different industrial setup. The world has moved on and how, and I feel if we do not indulge ourselves in our peripheral skills and not just indulge actually, that would be uh, wrong to say become good at it and become good at it and how like how we uh, follow our main stream maybe then there is no way for us to survive and this is kind of our survival tactic which uh, may come off across as entitled but we are actually not okay um, uh, one thing that uh, we're learning that we never really learned in the educational setup is to market ourselves and if we don't say that if we don't portray a sort of confidence, how do we, how do we, you know, achieve our goals? We can't, we can't say that we're learners, right? We need to portray some amount of confidence to be able to achieve the goals that we've set for ourselves. And in that process, we learn to market ourselves. So, I mean, that confidence is necessary. Why would I, why would I not want to have that confidence? Okay, I, I quickly want to revert back to the audience and especially the generation that identifies with these guys. Uh, have they, have they sort of, do, have they made a good case for you? Have they captured? your experience in some sense, you think? Yeah? Fairly recent? Okay, good. So now let me flip it over to this generation and say, I mean, do you think, I mean, this is a bunch of spoiled kids, uh, you know, I mean, having I a I think you're time, favoring that, had that team a lot. Good, no, I'm not. <laughs> having had a... You guys spoke for 20 minutes and is that what you're saying? No, the, the question I want to pose to you is... It feels this. like you all have, have four members and we have only three members. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Why question is, is this. The question is, you know, I mean, did we have to also struggle uh, to establish our own kind of self-identity or professional identity, if you like, in a kind of complex or shifting world as, as what they, they, they are sort of reporting to us? So it certainly was different. I mean, the first thing is, uh, let's just look at, I, I, I'm not speaking for Poonam or Shiva or... Uh, in 70s and the 80s, I paid 60 rupees a month for my design fee, for my education. I'm sure you had a slightly higher fee than that. Uh, now, that, that, that's an important factor. Uh, there was, uh, personally, amongst peers, etc., there was no great drive or desire or ambition to get jobs. You just muddled along and from one thing to the other. So the aspirations and the media environment and the expectations were quite different. And also, you, had, you were still very much a socialist India. You were not uh, post-19 India. And so the movies we saw or the media that you read and, and, and was quite different. So therefore, we, we located ourselves in formative years, if, if you look back, uh, was very different. I personally had a completely different experience because my first job was in a non-for-profit, small little NGO working on environment development issues uh, locally, nationally, and internationally. And I was not, I was not surrounded by designers. And, and also you were a not-for-profit, so everyone did everything to get the job done. So I, um, I, all my notions of being this very special person who does special things were all completely shattered very fast because suddenly the director of the organization walks by and says, um, do you have a scooter? So I said, yes. I, I'm supposed to be a visualizer in the magazine. And he's saying, can you go and report on some ammonia plant has had a blast and we need, there's no reporter and a photographer, can you go report about it? I said, uh, I'm not a journalist, I don't know how to do it. He thinks, just go, it takes common sense, you come back, write something, take a picture, that's all that it takes. So, and there I began my career as a journalist, which I'm not supposed to be one. Uh, or uh, someone came, came along and said, can you design this brochure? We are a small not, group of students who does work on environmental issues. And I said, yeah, I'll take two days and I will put type and I put color. And put. They said, oh, we've got no time, we've got a meeting day after. And then this person who made the request scribbled the whole note out and did little school squiggles on the margins and that was photocopied and it was out and I was still designing. So I think that that's what taught you that uh, you came with no <laughs> special privileged interest. You just were asked if you could deliver, think on the fly and do it. That's the environment one was in. 
So I, I think that um, there are two uh, things that I want to clarify. Being confident is not equal to being entitled. And I think the point that Arvind was trying to say was that there seems to be a certain sense of entitlement when um, when I meet a lot of young designers who come and say, okay, you know, I can do this. And behind that, sometimes I sense is that there's a, the point that you're making, I think your world is much harder. And I would agree with that. I think it's more abrasive also in the sense that uh, you have to fight very much harder to be different. Uh, you have to, in fact, it will take a, too much uh, to be able to step outside this, you know, this ma massive thing that you guys are seeing and you want to belong to and you maybe want to be successful in or you want to become good at or you want recognition. And it's a very human thing, no? I need to be recognized, I need to be valued. I need somebody to say that I'm worth it. And design, unfortunately, seems like it, like, you know, because we are almost what we do. So if somebody says this is not good, it means they're saying I am not good. And somehow, I would not agree with you that you're not taught how to market. I think it has nothing to do with marketing. You don't have to market anything if you're doing something good. It'll get known, it'll get, somebody will find out. Uh, but I think what is more important is that we are not ha taught how to separate the work from ourselves. That we're not taught in design school. And I think it's harder now, I agree with you, and therefore your sense of entitlement that you guys project is actually a sense of feeling scared. That's what I feel sometimes. Because you come across as confident, but actually inside you, you're also having self-doubt. I have self-doubt, yeah? Now. I mean, all the time I get up and say, I'm, 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 is my work worth it? You guys don't have the space to say that you have self-doubt. <laughs> you have to be pushed by this wonderful society you're living in. You have to be like so cool and no self-doubt and you can't let out and you can't be vulnerable. I don't know, that's what I feel. Can I, you had, you had a point out, did you want to, yeah. So uh, I, I have a bunch of things. I, I, hopefully I won't give everything out. Don't take right. more than 20 right minutes. Yeah. So one is, uh, this is uh, the social media world and we need to kind of recognize that there is a false front to everything. The life that you see is not the life that you actually have. And uh, so there is this... If there is any such thing. Sorry? If there is any such thing. If there is any such thing. And there is this entire story of, uh, you know, whether... It, uh, the question is whether it's confidence or a false sense of achievement. You know, so, so that question always comes up. Because, it, like, I love the point Puna made that it's very difficult. And we all know that it's very difficult. But you, that false front is what is very irritating. <laughs> That false front of, you know, the false sense of achievement that you want to kind of, uh, you know, throw around is, is a bit difficult to understand. And that's, uh, that kind of feels like entitlement, but that's fear, that there is a lot of insecurity, which we had too, which we had and we didn't understand and did not know and surely did not have to practice any falseness because there was not looking at our, nobody was looking at our lives on a daily basis on an hourly basis, right? So, surely not our peers. So, that's another thing. So, it, it seems like you want to impress your peers more than you want to impress your clients and the design world at large, right? So, so that is another worrisome thing. It looks like he'll hit me. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You have my so, permission. Um, another, another point that I have is depth versus breadth, uh, right? I, 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 at some point of time or the other, we have been thrown into stuff that we were not you know, till then we were not good at. And we had our uh, so many steps to kind of learn that, that stuff and probably become better, probably stay on for years and become a specialist in it, right? So, so depth versus breadth was always a common problem that we had. But right now, I see more breadth than depth. So for me, it took a long time to kind of say I'm specialized and then move on to other things that I was not specialized in, but uh, I, I, I don't think that's the case now. Um, then um, the last one is this, the, uh, not last, last but one, it's, it's a, the problem that we had is acceptance of design as a profession by the industry 
was kind of not there earlier, which, you, which somebody touched, really touched upon. But then the, you know, the, the, the glut of actual industries that are looking for designers also is, you know, in one sense, it, it actually nurtures mediocrity. And so there is a whole, you, if you've got a shine in mediocrity, it's always a problem. Unfortunately, slightly better than mediocre is super. Now, which is unfortunate. That, that should not be there, right? And um, instant gratification. So most often that the present design world is looking for likes and than really actually making solutions that are working hard. So being deeper kind of comes with solutions that work hard. And, and the question, I leave it to the question. I, I do not know the answer for it. The question is, are we looking for instant gratification rather than actually making things work for our users and our audiences and our product users or whoever the people that we're trying to solve the problem for. Okay. Do you feel that this sounds like, uh, you know, very convenient uh, abdication of responsibility? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, must as I should actually thank Arvind. Th thank you, Arvind. Sorry? No, no, he's the one who... Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, uh, I think uh, what has also happened is now design is a slightly old profession, right? You're seeing second generation, third generation designers, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you're seeing second and third generation designers, right? So one of the things is I feel that every designer that has come thus far, right? No one has really, like, Puna made this point of marketing is not really a thing, right? So uh, let's be honest, okay? Let, no design firm has done, you know, $50 million worth of turnover, okay? You, today, you can, you are more likely to have a startup as a customer who will outpace you in terms of revenue, who will grow faster than you, who will service more customers than you ever will. All right. And I feel that, you know, what's, what's happening is, to a certain extent, you, you haven't really set the bar, right? Like, you've assumed that, you know, like, let's, uh, you, know, you start a design studio, you start a design studio, you ka a design studio, you and then you retire, right? That's what design is. You're part of this industry. That's it. Now live with this reality. The fact of the matter is that's not what, 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 what you need to be doing. You need to be thinking about scale. Why hasn't design as a, as a profession ever been linked with the word scale? Why are you not doing work which is scalable? Why are you always you know, doing these kind of piecemeal projects, right? Which give you some little bit of revenue, you uh, exist off of it, and then you complain about people. You go to mojos and you're drinking that same dirty beer going, hey, design, tough life, tough. <laughs> That, that's not, that's really not a life to be leading, right? You have to be thinking beyond that. I mean, you talk about out of the box thinking, you think, talk about all of that. Why aren't you thinking about, you know, building something big? I mean, the one word that is tossed around in this whole bar house is quality of life, right? I mean, I'm designing this chair. At the end of the day, no one cares a shit about the chair, right? Like all you really care about is, I mean, is it a good chair? Is it comfortable to sit on? Yeah, fine. I mean, is it maple wood? Is it a teak wood? Is it a dovetail joint? Not my problem. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Can, can I respond to that? Can I? Can I? <laughs> yeah. So, I'm, yeah. Sure. So, the Maslow's hierarchy, the the, the triangle, where the pyramid, the down, the the dogs and scums of the universe who are down there, who are working horses, that's where you make the most money. By the way, right? Unfortunately, we designers. We want to be up there in the apex, and the apex does not work. And the apex does not pay hard. All the consulting companies are lying to you when they say they are $50 million, because they've got a whole bunch of the lower end of Maslow's hierarchy guys who are actually producing money for them. We, as designers, I mean, which, which I actually, I, I detest the idea of that, because technically I think that we've got to be in the middle. We should be doers and a certain amount of thinking that supports it. We should actually, when somebody comes and tell, tells, tells me that I'm a design thinker, I ask them, how do you earn? Right? There is, you know, <laughs> for me there is nothing. It's like going to Goa and asking for Goan fish curry. Obviously they're going to give you good. So like designers are design thinkers. So you cannot be anybody else. So given that, you don't need to go up into the consulting realm at all. Stay down, you will see scale. People did not. I agree. Why don't you do that for, an ins for a difference? Uh, why don't you do a farm of a creative farm where there is a whole bunch of people who are doing creative support, which essentially means 3,000 banners a day, for example? You will make a crap load of money. Uh, so, so, if scale is equal to money, 
you can have a PhD thesis on either side, right? On? on either side. I can prove that scale is not equal to money. You can prove scale is equal to money. We won't enter into that debate. I, so I'm not very clear what you're saying, frankly speaking. I'm not clear what you're saying. Because you're saying, okay, Tiga, why don't designers make money? Are you management you guys also ask the same thing. Oh, why don't managers make money? The farmers are saying the same thing. Why don't farmers make money? So if you want to make money, and if you have the skill to make money, go make money. There's nothing going to stop you. So design has not ever said, nowhere in any design book it says, don't make money. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so you clarify. Okay, let me clarify. Uh, so, you can say, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I, nowhere did I say money. Okay, I said scale. All right. Today, WhatsApp as a company has 50 engineers who serve service a product that is servicing 1 billion users. Right? That's, that's scale, right? You're actually creating something that creates massive change. It's a, it's a tool. Today, no design firm is actually doing, I mean, you open newspaper, right? And you, you tell me, do you actually see Isne and Iska in uh, his community is in the I mean, I, have you ever read Ogilvy has done something like this or whatever, you know, even Second has done something like this, anything of that sort? No, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you uh, Arjun, isn't that also a case of, um, in any field, right? Whether you take design or innovation or something. There is one guy, that Bertan Prickard, who took one solar flight and went around the world, right? <coughs> right? So he, people could say, why isn't Boeing doing it? Why isn't... So I'm saying, you're saying innovator. If you are, you've got, you have personally got that spark, go for it. I'm saying, what has it got to do with the profession? Okay, let me, let me intervene here. Yeah. I think on, on their behalf, let me try and frame the question for you, oh. which is that I think... No, um, yes, yeah, I think uh, that's a secret fact. Um, I think the question here is that, you know, the, their expectation is that this is the world that we have inherited. And it's set up in a particular way by f where we have to sort of, we are pushed to compete, succeed, uh, you know, establish ourselves and so on in a particular way. Uh, and, you know, that's the world that we have left created for them. That, is that all you're going to say? Just, is your problem? It's your problem. Not our problem? <laughs> We didn't create it. It, it looks like no, no, it. Yeah, I never created I, this world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm no, closer. I to you didn't create this world. No, we did not. But I'm saying, if whatever the situation is, status quo is, we are supposed to kind of challenge it and change it, right? So change it. Get it. We changed. We changed. Change. 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 Yeah, we got half. You know, uh, one foot in the graveyard, one in the bus. Okay. So you are the guys who got. So to me, bus, this ahead. sounds a little, a lot like entitlement. But we'll <laughs> let that pass. <laughs> I, I think also one has to understand uh, how do you define what is scale and what is your experience of scale. And I think one of the things is that, uh, especially the examples given nowadays of, uh, especially any digital media in terms of numbers it has reached and therefore how big it is, is it uh, helping you in terms of larger well-being? Is a question and the jury is still out on it. So therefore, there is a certain appropriateness of scale. And I think this idea about gigantism, or the bigger you are, the better you are, uh, I think needs to be questioned. Uh, no, no, and no, I think don't question it. I'm saying take it a fact that scale is very important. Go run for it, make it happen. I'm saying design is not saying it's not. Airbnb is made by designer, no? It's got scale, right? So I'm saying if you look at all those, there are, if there are enough and more. Now managers are doing design better, they're getting scale. Designers are not able to do it. Maybe we should ask, you should ask, because you guys are the young guys, you should ask question, why are the managers over, overtaking design and doing a greater job on scale? That, does it mean that designers inherently don't have that analytical skill to scale? I don't know. I, I've all, I, that question, I, I don't have an answer to. So I think I hear a kind of very, very sort of underlaying apology out here. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I have something to, uh, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, so um, I have this tiny bit of a problem that when people talk about scale, people only talk about money or, uh, right. you know, how much, how much, what is the valuation of this company? How much money are you bringing? What's your turnover? And da-di, 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 da. Uh, what I feel we also deal with in terms of scale is the very nature of the ecosystems where these designs that we are doing are thriving and living in. So, uh, so back in the days, again, I don't know how many years back, it's a uh, blurred line, 30, uh, 30 according to Rustam. Uh, back in the days, uh, it again, I could be very ignorant, but uh, to me, it seems like systems were set 
uh, hierarchies were set, uh, the if uh, processes were set, if you start something point A to B to C to D was, um, I mean of course there are inconsistencies, there are individual cases where things were very different and uh, people struggled and worked hard and everything, but there was an overall structure that was set within which uh, the hard work that was put on by designers was uh, to reach from A to B. Uh, I personally feel uh, as millennials, as designers in today's day and world, we not only have to fight uh, or do the hard work to reach from point A to B, but also question whether we are going from A to B or A to C. And then when we are putting out work out there and uh, uh, suddenly we are faced with this entire system where our work is thriving in a scale again here in not just in one space where you know we know that it's going to go to a newspaper and people are going to consume it this way and then this is the reach and these are the people who are going to look at it and then read it and like it's, it's going to be done by tomorrow. It's some things are stay, some things are ephemeral, like social media posts, like what he's saying. And uh, so we are constantly pulling strings of static things, things that are moving, things that stay forever, things that live forever. So it's like, you know, we have our feet in the grave, in the bus, in the train, in the flight, we have our feet everywhere. And now we are juggling all of that. So I feel that is something that millennial designers have to face. And uh, I mean, in between all of that, if we are curating our social media profiles, that's another bit of work too. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah of course. Of course. Just to, uh, something that Shiva said. So uh, one of the things that you said was, you know, you're projecting yourself on social media, and sometimes the person that you meet is not really. Uh, it's it's like what you see is not what you get, right? And I guess this is maybe kind of like a defense or a perspective. Uh, is that I think that. Uh, especially that you brought up the thing that we all have self-doubt, and I think that every every creative has that. You know, there is something like you know people will tell you you fake it till you make it and stuff like that, and you think that you know you put yourself out there and you get this project, you will rise to the occasion and you will deliver, right? That is obviously the hope, and that is it comes from a good place, it comes with good intention, and then sometimes you might just fall flat on your face, which will happen at least once, if not many times. So I would say that, that maybe the fact that you experience that, maybe that is what it is from coming from our generation, that it's what you see is not what you get. No, no, no. I was actually trying to define a world that we lived in which is very different. I agree with all the stuff that you are saying. We had nothing of that sort. We didn't have to prove, our, prove ourselves on a weekly, monthly, daily basis to anybody. We didn't have to really build a veneer of sort. We didn't have a veneer. Um, so, so I was trying to define the world that we lived in. Okay. Not necessarily talking about designers do it this way. Okay. Unfortunately, today it demands me to be the same, right? Like, a, you know, I have a LinkedIn profile that actually makes me look way glorious and fantastic than actually what I am. But the, the, the truth is, you know, we, this is the world. And, and, and that world was different. Okay. That's, all I'm, that's all I was trying to establish. It's nice to make it sound like I'm accusing you guys right now, but actually I'm not. So. <laughs> but I think the, the fact remains that our generation has in, been sort of, and us, all of us specifically, have been involved in teaching this generation. So I think there is a fair uh, legitimate you know, uh, agency here for them to challenge us or question us yeah. in terms of what we've really taught them. Sure. Uh, have we really taught them to deal with this world? And, and to actually you know, cope with this world and succeed and thrive in this world and make sense of it. No, I think uh, so that's one of the challenges of uh, education, which is you are trying to prepare someone for a future, immediate future, that is unseen, unknown, unpredictable. To us, not to them. Uh, true. Uh, and, and how then do you, and we come with certain uh, our own mental landscapes and models and experiences and legacies uh, and that's a challenge and I think how do you create a curriculum, a pedagogy, a learning environment that is preparing someone for 10 years from now and either side knows where you're going to end up and what that future is going to be like. So, so it, it's quite a, a creative act on both sides to come to something that works. And I think it's very important to give up something and not just to, uh, you have to sometimes give yourself up for the sake of a future and, and, and that person. I, I, it takes a certain degree of empathy and sensitivity to do that. 
because you come, or, or, or educators, all of us will come with our biases and preferences and legacies, particularly legacy even of learning. And often you find that you come with a certain legacy of learning and then you try and replicate that uh, in your educational uh, experience of uh, teaching. And I think that's a problem. Uh, okay, let me quickly cut to this group here and then I can go to the audience as well. To what extent do you think you have been sort of, uh, you know, disabled or handicapped to use the word by this kind of baggage that you have been, you know, passed on by, by the people who taught you? And that you have had to really, you know, work hard to shake out and find your own kind of bearings. Um, um, I don't see this as a baggage. Uh, uh, just to summarize what I'm getting out of this entire conversation. No, no, no. I is... don't want you to summarize. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Not summarizing, but let me, uh, like, I'm, I'm seeing this metaphor in no, my head. No, I'm just asking you to apportion blame that it's due. <laughs> okay, no, I, I'm, I'm I... coming to the blame. I'm coming to the blame. Okay. So, um, I'm hearing that you're saying we didn't have a car. We had to walk from here to there. You guys have a car and you are behaving entitled, saying that we don't have anything, we are struggling. What I am saying is, we yes, we do have a car, you didn't, uh, too bad, but we have to struggle to put fuel into it, and we have to... Uh, Manage the traffic jam. And the traffic jam, and the upkeep, and everything that comes along with it. Sorry? The bad roads, and all of that that comes into it. I think, uh, now that not I'm hearing everybody's opinions, I think this question is just a very... Uh, glorified version of ye aaj kal ke bachche <laughs> and <Not> and, <laughs> and uh, i just want to raise a point that i'm assuming that since you're gen x there was no generation before you who called y'all entitled right so then so then why why are y'all just carrying that value forward oh because that's what we are supposed to do <laughs> <laughs> I, i'll break ranks and come to your side because i deal with the education and so on all the time yes i think that's the worst thing you can uh, it's a cop out when you say aajkal ke bacche aise hain particularly as an educator i think failed educators are the ones who say uh, sort of pass the bug blame onto them and say that you know this generation is like that i'm often asked this question uh, now that i've been part of furniture and fossilizing electricity for now 12 13 years what's the difference between students who came 15 years ago and today that's a very difficult question to answer because not i i i, I still treat them as 16 17 year olds doesn't I, I, if you ask me i don't think there's very much of a difference because my job still is that challenge to get that person from here to there as a uh, learning and teaching experience that I create. After graduation or what, what, what is it that you're trying to? Well, entitlement is a much larger question and I think that's a question I'd like to ask the moderator and the audience over here. This idea, I think you're limited, we are talking about a very limited geography in terms of design and its role and its history in a neoliberal market, open market, uh, capitalist world. That's all that we've been talking about till now. There is a huge, vast world out there that exists that is out, if not outside that, but for instance, the state, government itself, uh, informal economies, rural economies. I mean, there are vast worlds out there. Majority of the population still lives in those and not in what we have been discussing. Whether they use WhatsApp or not. Okay. Um, I think we can, that was just a warm up round by the way, but we seem to have made a lot of capital out of that. Um, let me start the formal debate if you like, but based on a topic which has just come up automatically as it were in the, in the previous round, uh, which is the, the kind of so-called work-life balance theme. Uh, you know, to you guys, you know, is this something that's uh, an issue? Do you see them as separate? Do you see them as this one and the same thing? Are you sort of happy with the way it is laid out for you? Is it, is it you know, just give us some picture. Uh, I kind of raised this question earlier. This work-life question that we're talking about is, is not a very... Uh, I don't expect us to have the same answer and then to have the opposing answer. Sure, that's it's, fine. It's a, a, a completely a personality thing. I could sure. enjoy work more as... I could consider work my life or I could separate them. So. But if you could also, to some extent, generalize because you're not speaking only for yourself out here. Okay, so uh, I, I come with just two years of experience working in the industry two or three. Uh, the problem that I face is that when I work for somebody, I am expected to align my goals with their goals. 
and if they have the, the if if work is a priority for them they expect it to become a priority for us as well and sometimes they overlook the fact that i am here for growth i'm not here to fulfill their demands so that's a conflict that i faced so i'd possibly say that it's not a work life imbalance it's us having different goals and us not probably since since some on this side i think they don't identify that our goals can be different from their goals okay but just this is like a dipstick do you feel a stress in terms yeah, in your own life yeah, 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 you do and is it how high is it is it like very high extreme level of stress is it manageable moderate or is it quite cool i mean it's something that's completely under control where, where would you rate it depends it? on how long you're working or or what for you at this stage in your life what do you think moderate yeah moderate okay let's move it around arjun chandrina so what's the question work and life <laughs> is that is that something that in your life you know do you see them as separate as as contradictory as hard to deal with or is it no problem at all what i think it's a little bit of a mixed uh, uh, answer right because yeah, yes if you have to be passionate about your work you have to enjoy your work but uh, i mean that doesn't mean that your life is your work and your work is your life Yeah. <laughs> He's not asking. Um, no. Uh, so, um, so my take on this whole work-life balance is: I feel uh, our generation of people, or actually, let's just not do this generation. Just people who are smart enough uh, to know um, who, uh, what they want out of life. Let's say uh, I have seen. some amazing people out there who let's say want to work on design projects that is let's say not bringing in not much money or like but it's their passion project they have gone out created passive sources of income and uh, and on the side they are pursuing what they love what they're doing design then there are people who are you know when they let's say go into a job formation where they are not independent freelancers they are negotiating contracts i don't want to work for a year i want to work for 6 months i don't want to uh, uh, give me a year but then again i'm going to come in for 3 days and then there are people of course who are uh, this whole set of digital nomads they are you know if it's possible with their work if their work allows them they are traveling the world being somewhere working out of a beat somewhere and at the same time being extremely responsible with the work i'm not talking about the designers who you know just um, go off to go and then don't show up to work and like you know it's like okay what money what timeline what i'm not talking about those there of course those that chunk of designers also exist but then again that's a conversation for another day uh, so i feel uh, okay bring it on uh, but um, but but what i feel is that uh, there are more and more number of people now uh, who are really uh, designing their lives as much as they can around their work so that uh, for people let's say for whom work is 20% of their life and not 80% and they want to do something else they have figured that out and then there are people who for whom work is 95% of their life and that feeds them and then they have figured out what to do with their 5% so uh, uh, i mean not many people talk about uh, like these people who are really going out and doing it and doing it very successfully with maturity with responsibility and uh, this is not the side of millennials that usually people talk about or they are like you know irresponsible youngsters or uh, people like that but i believe there are tons of people out there who are doing that and in our defense that's a good ground to be in okay okay i think what she's trying to say is that we kind of treat ourselves as design projects as well yeah that's exactly what i was she just so said we design our you. lives uh, I, i thought that is a very very useful phrase and you know i mean how much does it resonate or strike a chord you create with, with, and design your life with your lot i mean is this something that you did or are doing currently or was it ever a right, feature i would say currently and, and she also sort of qualified it with the adjective smart so smart people design their lives you know i mean whichever proportion you work it out in 20 80 80 20 whatever it might be Yeah. what are you guys doing i think after you know i don't know 24 23 years of working now i can probably afford to design my life if i can call it that I but see. but what i, I, I wouldn't have thought of doing it in any possible way because it was uh, you know first of all this entire compartmentalization so i'm uh, going back to that saying that it's a fantastic saying that designers don't retire i mean i'm seeing it as a even a daily thing you don't go to sleep that's what retire means not necessarily the end of the career right designers don't retire they die that's what the stuff says right which is quite an interesting thought i mean if it is a way of thinking 
as, as they call it, and, and a way, method in which you can actually do it to your life, it doesn't stop, it doesn't possibly stop. But my point is the other side that she refused to talk about, which I... Yes, bring it on. 20 odd years I've actually been working as a part of a design team, and I've also set up teams over time, right? And those teams and the behavioral aspect of those teams have actually changed over time, you know? So the important stuff is that I see in a big, as a big change is the sense of responsibility. Hmm. Like um, a job given, is a job to be done. It's task-based. Nobody demands time, but, you know, having said that, there is a certain time thing of contact time that we need to have, which essentially means there is a starting hour of business that probably that we need to be around, yeah, or send a robot or something, you know, like be there, right? I, don't, I haven't seen that. I, so that is another thing of attached idea of that, you know, this... Uh, so, um, so these are hygiene factors, this entire time management piece, ability to project manage yourself and project manage the project that you're working on, be around for the team, not necessarily for you, yeah. don't go off to Goa and never call me, yeah. is what I'm talking about and that's a problem that I always have and if that is what work-life balance is, right. we don't want work-life balance. <laughs> okay. Um, what I'd like to say to that is if... One second, uh, One second. I, I want to also put it to the audience. I mean, I, I want to know what your take on the way it's shaping up now is. Um, I mean, are, are you resonating with her argument or with the side's argument, really, that this generation is getting its act together, is actually getting into the act of designing life early on in, in their career instead of waiting for 25 years, and in this case, um, or do you hear the, the kind of the very thinly veiled complaint coming from that side about, uh, you know, okay, no, not veiled at all, unmasked complaint, yeah, that, 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 that that's perhaps, you know, the, the picture that's portrayed here is perhaps only applicable in a very small case, but generally speaking, it's the other way around. So we might have some exceptional, uh, you know, examples here of this generation, but that doesn't seem to be the case on the streets. What's your take? Yes. Um, I think I agree with Shiva. I okay. am a millennial. Right. Unfortunately, it's a term wow. I don't Good enjoy. Time. Yes. But, uh, based on what you said, that your goals don't align with the person you're working for, why are you wasting your time? Yeah. I, Simple. Don't waste that person's time. Don't waste your time. Go do what you really love. Design your life. You do realize that you're describing what millennials are already doing. Like nobody holds a job for more than one year. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a reason why that's happening, right? Because then this is where I think that sense of entitlement kind of comes Or responsibility, from. if you like. Yeah, or responsibility. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's where it's coming from. Also, I feel like um, just in terms of design, because it's become so expensive, a lot of uh, people today are coming from families that are better. You can afford to say, oh, I'll take a break for three months. I'll take a break for a year. I'll work from Goa. I'll just do some work. Like like Arjun said, you go to Mojo's and then you crib about your fees. You have to pay for that beer, right? Which means you need to hold a job or start your own design firm, whatever it is. So I feel like it's very easy to say things when there is somebody who's taking care of your basic needs and all of that. It's 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 a lot harder if you're either either financially responsible for everything that you do, or maybe you live away from home. Then suddenly you realize, oh, I somebody has to pay the rent. Mummy and daddy are not going to send you. This. Okay, Shankali, no. Um, we're not no. broke, right? We're, we're not unemployed. There are examples. I mean, I think I think the people that you are describing, they're not going to sustain. I don't think they are. I'm, I'm but but that, that's the majority of the market, right? That's the people who are who, as designers, we're supposed to employ. And like you said, if most people are not going to kind of remain in their jobs and all of that, what's the quality of work that you're going to end up producing as a result? So this is really fascinating. I mean, I'm seeing uh, the fault line very clearly now. It depends on whether you're an employee or you're an employer. And that really, really seems to change the position completely. I don't think that's true. I mean, it's not that because I employ people today that I see it that way. I have seen this even when I was in Srishti and trying to get an internship. There were a lot of times where people would say, oh, please, uh, please make sure you actually come to work. We've hired kids before and they've not shown up. Sure, sure. We've heard those stories and clearly it is... It is a fact. It's not. It's not just me. There are other people. Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. But I think what you. I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying as well. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. But I think what you were trying to say is that it's difficult to work 
like it, the, the hope is that you want to also work with if I may say veteran designers, I mean it's not that you want to only stay in your bubble and you're going to work only with millennials and stuff. The, the thing is that we want to work together and that sometimes doesn't happen because of this uh, reason that you pointed out and I think that's what you were trying to say if I'm... No, I'm saying understood. that it has happened because the... Because the, the goals are not aligning are not and the, it's like uh, you do what I say or whatever that is, right? I don't know if that's what you were saying but that's... I mean yeah, to, 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 to an extent. But yeah, I mean, it differs from the, like you were talking about the employer-employee sort of setup or the freelancer setup. And also what she said about how she's, she's experiencing, I mean, you get that it's a millennial fighting against a millennial, right? So we're not, we're not, uh, we don't want to typecast, we don't want to typecast our generation as just but, but typically speaking, let, let me step in a bit here. I think that because of the age factor, there is all automatically implied a particular kind of position or in the hierarchy of work. And if you're starting out your career, you're most likely to be working for somebody who's paying you to do it. And as you grow older and more whatever accomplished or settled in your life, you're more likely to be the one on this side of the table who's basically commissioning the work and paying for it. So that's actually the so-called line that I'm finding here. It may or may not have to do with the particular generation as such or age as such. Some people might actually switch to the side very early on in their life, but and some may remain an employee for, for their whole lifetime. But I'm saying that the perceptions that are sort of coming from these different positions are not informed so much by the age factor, perhaps, as by this the, the role or the you know the responsibility that you are fulfilling in your professional uh, life, really. Uh, I would have to say that I have actually observed a more counterintuitive um, uh, sort of perspective regarding this. So first of all, coming to the responsibility question, that I don't, uh, which I was uh, trying to say that that's a conversation for another day. I don't personally feel that that's a millennial versus Gen X uh, disorder. It's mostly a people and their characteristic disorder. Um, so there are some people who are responsible, there are some people who are not, and then there are the people who are in the gray lines in between. Uh, but coming to this question of uh, the person with the responsibility who is, let's say, uh, bringing money uh, from the clients as opposed to the employee who is just giving in time. Many a times uh, what I have observed is like there are these extremely hardworking people really far down below the hierarchy who are giving it all in because they feel for it or maybe they are still too young and have, which uh, again, we have all had our rose tinted glasses when we just get into work and we want to just give it all out and it's not just the money but the work itself is feeding us and we are feeling good about it and we also genuinely do want to good by the project that is happening so I have seen that and at the same time I have seen people who are on the other side who are let's say just project managing and then um, because now they know that they can uh, Sort of ex exploit is a very strong word, but uh, they can use the person on down the line in the hierarchy, their time and effort and um, juice as much as they can. Pra and this is a practical scenario. I've seen this in multiple scenarios where it has happened that uh, they are the ones who are stacking off and then you know putting blame onto the team, saying that you're not good enough or you're young. You're um, uh, so uh, so. This is something that I have observed, which I feel is does it does not matter whether you're an employer or employee. Uh, whether you are bringing in the money, who is at, what is at stake. If you are responsible, you are going to be responsible. If you are not, you are not. Okay, uh, we can leave it at that for now and move to the next topic really, which is about the kind of uh, professional or um, collegial kind of attitudes of these generations. The question here is which of the two generations, if one was to divide a line between the two, is uh, more open or generous? or in terms of sharing, in terms of being open about information, in terms of collaborating with each other. Uh, what's your take on that? Okay, so um, uh, everyone on that side of the table has been, uh, has taught me at some point in time in my uh, design education, right? And uh, to be honest, I honestly think that uh, that generation is a lot more open than our generation is, right? In the sense that anything you want to learn, any any skill set, any kind of question, any kind of advice that you need, you, you've always given it. Uh, which, uh, to be honest, like I don't think uh, you can really have a very uh, 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 honest uh, uh, kind of discussion with your peers and get uh, you know, the same kind of open 
right. uh, wisdom as you would uh, kind of term it. So, yeah. One point but but to just push the point a little further, wisdom is a nice thing because it is very generalized. Sure. Uh, and, and but when you talk as peers, you're talking on particulars as well. Um, so does it sort of you know have you got the same kind of generosity from this generation even in particular terms? For example, uh, you know contacts or uh, information about some opportunity or information about pricing. Uh, kind of stuff that is much more particular than global gyan saying you should be nice and you should sort of do good. I think so. Okay. I think they've always been uh, very forthcoming, which is something that you have to kind of appreciate. Okay. Fantastic. Let's uh, spice the pot. Why? Accept? Let's let's yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I, I am saying that uh, not necessarily. I'm not talking about Arjuna. Arjuna and I work in the same domain in one sense, so we have a lot in common. Then you're, you're competitors. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know. The important stuff, especially in an organizational setup, it's not about sharing. It is about expectation to share. Okay. Expand. Expanding. So very, <laughs> the the actually the the new recruits or the you yeah. know the the mid and the lower end of the the design department, if I can call it that, yeah. is typically there is hardly any origination that comes out of that part itself. And there is an expectation to, uh, like putting it mildly, support and, and push them forward in one sense towards a solution. And that expectation is there 100%. And it's like uh, the, the entire wheel will come to a grinding halt if, if, it's, if it does not happen. That kind of goes along with the responsibility slash thing that, is along, that comes along with it, right? That is kind of one. And, um, um, I think it's, it's unaided origination versus adapting something. So they're constantly looking for inspiration, quote unquote, which yeah. is the Anu Malik version of inspiration, <laughs> really. And, and I, I think that is a little unfortunate, uh, especially in a, like, I have seen people, the first stopping point is Behance, if you actually throw a problem at them. While I would have, you know, thought that probably talk to four people who are actually going to use that thing as a... Uh, stuff, you know, so, and then that is an aided... That's just because you didn't get, have Behance then. Oh, uh, yeah. That, no, even now I don't use Behance. <laughs> and, then, and then there's got to be an aided support, an aided push to kind of say, so which essentially brings me to the stuff that it, there is no framework thinking from a process perspective. I mean, again, I'm not talking about you guys specifically, but I'm talking about the generation at, at large, that there's no framework thinking from a process perspective that different contexts you can apply the same thing. That I do not see that happening without aid. So I think it's because also they're not taught. Go ahead. Because they're not taught. They're not taught. Okay. They're not taught. I think that's also because our generation is, uh, has a lot of resources and there's a lot of resources available to us. Yeah. And I think that's also because our generation is full of resources. We don't, need, we don't find a need to go talk to somebody. It's just like Google it up. No, but then you, you do that's, what that's I That's what we miss. Like, I totally agree to that. Like, I, I wish I could go talk to four people and not Google it. No, no, you, you, okay. You know, the difference is, I, I just, I don't know how much, uh, how, how, you know, whether you know this. In very, very good design schools abroad, they will not accept you Googling. They expect you to go out into the field. Good design firms will not hire you if you do not have that ability. Because all these tools are made. Of course, the resources are wonderful. I love the fact that we've got gold pouring out of every pot that you can see. But the gold is meant for us to use. And it's like saying, boss, there are people out there. <laughs> Go meet them. Rustam? I think uh, this thing of uh, how do I learn is something that uh, we have to acquire. You should become autonomous. <laughs> and there should be a certain agency within yourself. And if you are always going to sort of hide behind secondary sort of access through internet tools, etc., obviously you're not going to have any primary experience. And I say experience, not facts or data. And that's something that uh, I think we had an advantage where we were not surrounded, as Shiva has been uh, had said once or twice, that we, we, we were not in that media landscape. We didn't have it. We had to go out there and experience the world ourselves. 
and that has stood us in good stead and one has uh, got an abiding interest in people, place, etc., uh, which still uh, is useful. And you're not so dependent on more and more data and information. I'll just add, that, add one, one more point to this stuff. I've so I, earlier I wanted also, it's not necessarily about uh, seeing work on the internet alone. I mean, if I actually kind of define our practice, there is a clear, not a clear line, but there are two parts to it. There is the entire conceptual part to it, there is a tactical part to it. There is a method in which you think and you actually define something as a solution which is based on a whole bunch of hypotheses. And then there is a method in which you use your skills to kind of represent it in a good way or execute it. Uh, I don't see both, like going back to what Rusam said, as a you know, singular autonomous agency, I don't see that both in, in, in people who I hire these days. Okay. So I don't hire many, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, let me quickly sort of, sort of, you know, nudge the discussion towards another issue, which is actually nicely emanating from this discussion, which is, um, I mean, there's a reference or a discussion going on about originality. Um, and, and how does that figure in your scheme of things? Uh, we are talking about successful and accomplished now. I mean, in your kind of generational view or aspirational view of what it means to be successful and, and accomplished, how much does originality really, uh, you know, figure in that? And what are the other elements maybe, if at all, in, in the mix, which, which for you would define success or achievement? Uh, no, just uh, when you say originality, do you mean uh, how original is our work in, yeah. in terms of that? Because that's where we came from, right? Google, Behance, these kind of things. That's what I'm picking up on. Okay, so, uh, so one thing, first of all... Uh, I'm also reminding you of another point that Shiva made earlier, which is that just slightly better than mediocre is outstanding. Okay, uh, so I, uh, so first of all, uh, just to, uh, I was taught by that generation of designers uh, that nothing is original for nobody. <laughs> it's always derivative. We are humans, we have built on things over and over and that's how we have progressed. Uh, then coming to this whole idea of Pinterest, Behance, Inspiration, Google and all of that. I, uh, I have to agree, it's unfortunate, it's, there is tremendous amount of work f that goes out there in today's day and time that is just a copy paste work, uh, an aesthetic copy, a uh, design solution copy, some sort of a copy of something that is already there and not a copy in a way that you know you have taken some bits of it and then like really applied yourself to it. Uh, so I am not going to defend that I am personally against something like that and I, I don't know how to defend something that is a flaw of our generation. If I am uh, talking about the millennials over here, I have to take this one on and saying that yes, we are as millennials extremely guilty of going out there doing copying uh, just for the sheer, I mean, I don't think this is even an excuse saying that we have to generate so, such a huge mass of work. I mean, this is a problem we have bought it on ourselves, uh, fed by many different forces, but it is true. But uh, at the same time, what uh, I'd like to say, which is a positive attitude or a positive outcome of being in a sphere where we are connected by the, via the internet and we have access to all these resources, we also have access to now a lot of people, let's say senior designers, contemporaries who are not maybe in the same country, there's somewhere else who we look up to, who we really uh, uh, appreciate their work or we like their design thinking to get into a conversation with them via let's say social media. Yeah. You can pick up a conversation with them on Twitter. We can, you can go and discuss their viewpoints on Medium. Uh, so we have op all these tools as a counterpoint as well. And I see people doing that. They uh, appreciate someone's work or they look up to uh, someone's uh, way of thinking. And then they reach out to them. And because of this whole democracy of how people get approached, and uh, this, this sharing is a very beautiful thing that has come out of the uh, sphere that uh, uh, we have around here. I mean, what do you guys think about it? Like, I uh, personally feel that, of course, there is the bad side of it, but there is also a tremendous good side. Go ahead. I actually I mean, it's 
of interest and let's just make life easy because anyway no one cares why should I make so much of effort think about it conceptualize it do all of this stuff but no one cares right. even listen to me so wait I was I was really afraid of this Sorry? I was afraid that you know in between the two generations fighting we'd find a common enemy so, so let's not go there because the MBAs are always there. <laughs> you know, we can always do that after the debate is over. Yeah, yeah when we have a drink together or something. Yeah, let's clear clear of that. But I was just uh, I think this, this business of originality. If I just step back a bit and looked at it historically. Sorry, one, no. I just want to yeah. uh, put just uh, frame a question, which is that, you know, I mean, do you think we make a big deal, a big fetish of originality? It's a good question. I mean, that, and that's exactly what I'm going to say. That a, one first has to locate oneself where you are. And then if one steps back and look at it a little bit temporarily in terms of time, uh, then you will realize originality means different things, different cultures, groups, people, and where they're located. So if I'm a crafts, let's say in the crafts or artisanship, originality means something completely different. But if I am some Bauhaus or I'm in some Italian design firm in the 50s or 60s, originality meant something completely different. You fetishized objects, you uh, uh, the author was celebrated. Uh, what I like about this business of cut paste and uh, internet and beg, borrow, steal that is happening today, actually I quite like it because I think it demolishes this whole thing of uh, having these caste hierarchies within designers and then entitled uh, privileged designers from a certain part of the world, etc. And of course, it's going to create a lot of uh, uh, CMYK, you know, uh, color schemes. I love it. I think it's a good thing. I think it's nice to have this mess around. And what I really like is this democratization that uh, I, I'm no longer dependent on this cool designer. I can produce some crappy thing of my own and make it work. And uh, too bad if you cool designers don't like it. Uh, it works fine and my business is going well. Uh, I'd, I'm not such a great uh, fan of originality. Originality doesn't come high on my list of, okay, must do's in your life. But I definitely think if you want to practice design and you want to do it for some user, if the user is a tree, if the user is a person, then you have to go and immerse yourself in the context. I think you cannot do that bit in any other way. Of course, you can put out a lot of cut paste coffee and I agree with Rustam, democratization is damn good. You don't have to wait for one dada who will walk in with one easel, who will, you'll do pranam and you will do seva chifang and all that, you don't, all that is crappy, is out of the window. But if you want to do it for somebody else, that you have to be able to listen to what that person needs or that context needs. And I find that, the, having said that your world is very difficult, the amount of opportunity that is not being tapped and precisely because of this democratization. What has happened is there's so much easy money available in this. And that is the only problem. <laughs> Shiva? Still there is no scale, but lots of money. Uh, once, once, one extension. Sure, sure. It's important that I go right after Poonam on this. Clarification is that, I mean, uh, the context, the idea of staying in context to actually produce something original is important. Like one of the stuff that I constantly keep coming back to is the fear of vernacular for this generation. You know, how many people have actually, we were pushed into it. You know, I, at some point of time when I did not know how to read Telugu, I was pushed into designing a Telugu newspaper. You know, or, or contextually very different. I mean, like some uh, specific communication pieces for the rural communities in, in a certain, doing a certain thing. So these are stuff that you're pushed into, and I see that there is a phenomenal fear of vernacular, and that is because of ability to kind of shun the context and use the democratized world very easily to reapply, if I can use, the, uh, uh, use that term, to quickly get out. Okay, yeah, you had a point? I think just coming back to the point of, you know, scale and bringing back the previous thing, I think whether it's this generation which is, you know, totally worried about the number of they have, or this generation is worried about the number of, you know, followers. I think at the end of the day, design is meant to serve function, right? It's whether, you know, it is original, whether it is copied at the end of the day, like she said, if there is a certain business brand, 
factory animal, right, who you know, gets his function served by the design that you create or what you create, right? That is the primary idea of you doing it. Right now, coming back to scale in terms of when we say originality, right? And we have Pinterest and we have all these apps. In fact, I've seen an app which does, you know, custom branding if you put in keywords. And, you know, I worry about where I'm going to go next. Now, the fact that we can create, you know, work and the fact that we can copy so easily, right, is also something people have used to scale where people today will do an entire month of content including copy and design and your entire digital marketing at peanuts because it's easily accessible and then you know those are businesses that are you know highly scalable because they all serve a function so i think at the end of the day i mean when i look at it i think it's each individual designer whining about some problem they have saying i'm not making it. oh i'm not original oh my design isn't you know scale i think if we just kind of figure out and say, hey, this is my problem, let me find a way to, you know, design a solution for it, I think it works both ways. Because I've seen millennials make shit tons of money, right? And I've seen, uh, you know, uh, the other generation also have it very easy because of, you know, not really having competition. So I think at the end of the day, I just feel like we're continuously whining about the problem rather than as designers finding that you we, you, did you say we? Yeah, we. <laughs> yeah, we. <laughs> okay. So that's 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 a good provocation in itself. But yeah, let me hear, let's have your voice. So I quickly want to take that out to the audience and ask for a general show of hands. I mean, how many of you related with what she just mentioned? This whole uh, kind of passion being linked with the desire to do things right, do things following the due process and all that, but uh, you know, not given the chance or opportunity to do it very often in life. Okay. I mean, we did get the opinions. Maybe we should have a round with you guys again Actually, on what. Yes, yes. Anybody else who raised the hand to speak, please speak. Because we are running out of time and you won't have time to speak anymore. Please go ahead. I just want to move that back to you. Is this more whining? <laughs> no, I think, I think at least someone is looking at the problem and saying, let's start educating the people we have to yeah, so Okay. And, and stop whining. We have problems, the other guys are the bad Okay, you guys have anything to say? Okay. Uh, 
environment because people, you know, it's, it, everyone is talented, everyone has great ideas, everyone, like it's there and that's why we want to come to work and all of that. But finally when it comes to executing and what work we are making finally has nothing in it. We just, I think when we're sitting at the lunch table and we're talking about ideas, everyone gets excited and that stays at the lunch table. It's lunchtime talk, it's water cooler talk, it, it just nowhere to kind of, I mean once in a while maybe you might get an opportunity to work on something super exciting and that's Okay, now that makes me wish I was a panelist, but I'll abstain. Uh, uh, I just want to have one another round, another theme before we basically move towards the wrap up of this, which is around the topic of social responsibility, socially responsible design, or call it design for impact, whatever terminology is good for you. Let's let's have a little discussion on, around those issues. So the question for you, your generation, is that, and and which again goes back to some of the issues that were raised here, which is that you guys just you know sit on the screen and do you know you manipulate the world all the time. You just don't even bother to step out of your cafe or you know whatever bar that you guys are at, in some sense. So I mean, what's your take on social responsibility? I mean, do you even have anything to say? <laughs> wow, that's so deep. So. Uh, uh, I'm on your side. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, you, you know, there's this uh, massive um, uh, uh, idea that's spread. You know, like for example, you see these social campaigns online. You know, Facebook for like, karo, whatever that <laughs> ice bucket challenge and all that, right? And and it's such stupid stuff, right? Like, frankly, I mean, can you imagine throwing ice on yourself? Bill Gates did it. Kanye West did it. President Obama did it. And uh, you know, there are people actually going to Facebook and liking the video. And I mean, honestly, uh, uh, it, it, it's just such so much spin, right? That the the actual uh, uh, need or the actual uh, problem is being overshadowed by it, right? And I feel that that's where, uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I think both sides of the panel kind of fall prey and victim to this, uh, where where no, you don't. don't <laughs> I'll Speak go through your yourself. Facebook feed, huh? Just to check, you know, ALS. Okay, all right. So, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's it's uh, it, there's there's just so much nonsense that you have to really kind of cut through it to actually find what is of relevance, what is something that you actually have to action, what is something, and again, it comes down to you know, find something that you're passionate about and kind of contribute. But the, the important thing is participate. Can I, can I respond to that? Or? Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, one, um, I think there is, there is uh, India is, as a country that we've lived in and hopefully we love um, the way it is now. Yeah, the way it is now. I'm, I'm saying that I, I, I think there's a lot of passion about getting this place better and that opens up a phenomenal amount of ground. Unfortunately, it demands going out of Facebook. Unfortunately, it demands a lot of stuff that there, there are lots of people doing good stuff. There is people who are actually asking for help. Uh, there are a couple of firms that I work for, pro bono. Sometimes they actually have the money to pay too. It might not be great money, but they do have the money to pay too. But they constantly need help in whatever way to improve or uh, better or, or even just construct simply. And the challenge is that they could be the communication could be vernacular. The communication could be for audiences that you don't want to or we don't want to associate ourselves with. It's a rude awaken awakening. There is no format that is kind of pre-represent this in some way that I can follow that is available in Behance. There is no such thing. The, and we should be able to embrace that very well. I mean, there are, there are, we should be able to easily embrace that and that I do not see much happening and it's unfortunate. But would you say you were equipped to do this when you were young in that kind of place? Uh, yes, I would think, to, think so. The reason being that, you know, I, I, we are all from the same college, but I, I can tell you that we, we were in a college that was kind of too grounded with the reality that was kind of open in front of us in many ways. And we were forcefully pushed into places that even if we did not want to go dragged into places where there is, you know, the context was very apparent and uh, you felt that you had to do even as a i'm talking about this as a as a graphic design i know that as an industrial design industrial designer they had more to do with this thing and they actually were deeper in it as a graphic designer who at that point of time was looking at neville brody actually had a reality that is about communication of 
aids to truck workers in specific i did not work on it friends worked on it but then you know you there is an awakening there is kind of contextual correctness that kind of wakes you up there is a spark and you tell, tell yourself hopefully at some point of time i would be able to participate and with what the little that i know i would be able to contribute to this and but let me I quickly flip it back i mean is this the kind of you know opportunities that you have got in your experience uh, like of the kind that she was talking about i mean because the picture that i'm getting from your side is that that you know everything looks very confusing and blurry and you don't know what is real and what is not real where to contribute and whether it really makes an impact or not because everything looks the same on the on the front of it and perhaps in your life in your kind of you know course of life you don't really get those kind of chances whether by omission or commission which sort of throws you at the deep end and and then you really sort of grapple with with issues as they really might be on the field is that um, how it is uh, so uh, what my opinion on this is i um, am again uh, not sure not 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 very happy with the black and whiteness of how he's projecting that That's we are a uh, okay. tech uh, based generation sitting in front of Facebook all the time, not ever getting out there, not doing anything, not being socially aware. We have nothing beyond our, let's say, um, uh, urban identity uh, that we are kind of aping from the Western, let's say, a New York designer, Berlin designer, or something like that. Uh, I disagree on that. I mean, um, again, here it's about numbers, how much of it is happening here, how much of it is happening there. Um, I have seen people of my generation, again, uh, work immensely with vernacular projects. Projects that are uh, to the soul out and out from whichever region they are in. I have personally worked with, uh, one of my passion projects is working with the Assamese language. That's what I did my graduation project on. Then there are, uh, let's say for example, taking the people who are working at Indian Thai Foundry, creating all these contemporary typefaces in so many different vernacular languages that are exactly being used every day in news channels, newspapers, uh, giving it a, like, you know, creating something which is of the modern Indian aesthetic, but at the same time the root is of an Indian aesthetic which is not Western or which is not being aped. So um, then let's say for example there is I follow this uh, one person who has uh, uh, this social media page where he promotes his work. It's called the Khwab Tanha Collective where he coll uh, collates all these Urdu poetry uh, works by Manto, works, uh, works by the greats of uh, Urdu literature and then he illustrates and puts things out there and we consume that sort of content too on an everyday basis which uh, I, would, I would say is a big part of our culture. It's not like we are only there, black and white, um, uh, you know, sans serif, uh, work with startups. Just like you know, that's that's not just the only kind of picture that uh, is out there with the millennials. So there's a whole different side to it. Maybe it's lesser. Maybe it's because uh, again, here I have to bring in bring in uh, the fact that there is not a lot of money or um, patrons in this sort of a field, so that people can push more, give their life. Too, but the ones who actually want to do are giving it out there and are basing it. So I would have to completely disagree that our generation does not deal with anything related to social. Um, I or Sorry. I was actually talking about putting it to good use. Okay. Not Manto's poetry. I don't care about Manto's poetry. But uh, but is it not a, is it not good use if there are people who don't know about okay. it are coming a cultural delight that is good use. Yeah, cultural delight doesn't. Would either of you have something to add to that? <laughs> the road, the what, road to hell is paved with be? good intention. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah. Responsibility is also discussing social issues in today's, you know, day and age. Forget having Mantos poetry or, you know, 20 different uh, Indian typefaces. There are designers who, out of their way, work on campaigns, you know, that talk about social issues in today's day and age. Like, 
you know, feminism, I mean, I don't even want to use the word because there's 400 other opinions that are going to, you know, rev up the debate, but there are people who are continuously working towards, you know, creating these campaigns, maybe on a digital, uh, you know, forum or on a digital platform, but you see them every now and then, and people participate, not in one, but in many, and are able to do it continuously, you know, besides their work, like, there are people who support these campaigns by actually putting in design work. There are people who collaborate and come together to do, you know, to beautify roads or to, you know, create just awareness about social issues that we have. So how you may feel philanthropic, you know, by saying, oh, you know, instead of donating money, I put in my services. I think that philanthropy is kind of evolved too. It's like 2.0, you know, where you do it but in a different way and. Sometimes you don't realize it, that you're doing it, but we put in a lot of effort and we've been able to bring in so many more, you know, social issues out into people's, uh, you know, viewpoint and actually change that. I think that makes a huge difference too, and that's being socially responsible. Okay. My point comes from there. Most of the studios that I have worked on has actually done that. Okay. The point is that there are very few people who have the courage from the not-for-profit not domain, very few people who have the courage to go and ask these studios really, will you do it for free? And there are lots of studios that are ready to do it. Not necessarily for free, at cost is probably the right way to put it. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I feel like that is a bigger challenge because a lot of young designers would love to work on a social impact project. Absolutely. But but I think there's, there's also a sort of another uh, sort of overtone to this, which is that how far are you willing to go to work on those projects? And I think that's something maybe. But I think this, uh, having sort of had my feet both in civil society and uh, sort of social and my sectors and design world. I was a bit wary of uh, this thing of designers claiming that they are solving wicked problems because they did a poster for some social cause or whatever. Because I think the, the thing is you're ignoring the elephant in the room. Uh, I think it's a lot of self-gratification and self-indulgence that I've, I, I, I'm, I'm doing all the evil 90% of my time, I am screwing up the world and doing my thing, but 10% of my time I do it for free or pro bono or whatever. Uh, I would rather look at the other way around that uh, in your mainstream business and politics that you do, what is it that you're doing there? Uh, whatever you may be doing. Uh, and how, and that's where one has to, and I think designers are to blame for themselves for this, that they think they come with these silver bullet ideas and original ideas and we solve wicked problems. And I think the days of designers, they've attempted it. In the last 10, uh, two decades, designers have come in and said, we will solve wicked problems. And we know where that has ended up. Yeah, that's 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 a sign. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I think they have to be quite quite careful uh, about this. No wicked problem is going to be solved by one side. You have to have mainstream business and politics, and you have to address that, and not be happy by producing some nice little campaign for some small. Okay. Just one thing to add is that this actually, I cannot overemphasize how much today's world needs everybody's input. Everybody. It is reached that stage and you all are capable. Everybody coming out of design schools has enough, like you said very rightly, enough pocket uh, bank balance so you're really not worrying for sustenance. So therefore you should go out more, take more risks because your dal roti is paid for here. And the world really needs you. And you get involved. The other thing that you're saying about this project not sticking, like you have this water cooler projects and all of that, you have to stick. And you have to find other people who can stick. If you don't stick, it takes sometimes 10 years, yeah? And that capability and muscle, who's going to tell you? It has to be built. 
एंड फॉर दैट यू हैव टू टेक अ डिसीजन ये नहीं करूंगी ये करूंगी सो दैट्स अ हार्ड डिसीजन बट यू हैव टू टेक इट इट्स लाइक दैट but on that i mean just to go back to the generational divide is there really this divide or is it just matter of personal choices that we made some of us made it and some of us can still make i mean it's not to say that we made it and they don't make it but there's some people in our generation made it or did not make it and like by some people in their generation also i think there's more opportunity more opportunity to to do to do something okay so maybe maybe it's up to us really to to bring the opportunity to them Uh, and perhaps in because we have also sort of figured out that there is a comfort zone kind of phenomenon at play here that you know it's or maybe as a fear factor outside the comfort zone which needs to be sort of addressed some somewhere uh one thing which i would like to add and it goes back to the very first thing which was discussed the sense of entitlement i think more than that it's to like apart from it being personal choices you also have to look at overall landscape and post independence the generation which was there was mainly working for survival like their the parents will tell like okay you have to go get a job you have to you know work for the family the big family you have to get this much so that was the main priority they did all that to enable us to have a better life than what they had now the generation the millennial or whatever it is for them like design education is fairly expensive in india also right now if you do a masters then forget about it if you do all that and if you have taken a education loan imagine paying that education loan but if you don't have that you should at least acknowledge that privilege and have that in back of your mind and respect that because it doesn't mean you have to everyone has to go and take a 9 to 5 job that you can take it as a personal choice but if you have the privilege of making that choice then make it count and by doing your work that's all um i think we are pretty much around to reach the end of the time available so i'll just take some questions or comments from the audience now and you can address either the individual panelists or everybody or each other as well i do have a so i would like to believe that i am a mix of both uh, i would like to ask you 30 years or 20 years down the line Will be a whole generation, right? And what would you want to do not to have a debate like this 30 years down the line? I think. <laughs> um. I want to have this debate 30 years down the line. You know. I think it's I mean, unavoidable. I think absolutely. No, not the fact that it's unavoidable. I think it's it's needed. You know. You need to. It, it's it's like a review, almost. So. <laughs> But go ahead, panelists. um what i feel is uh, that 30 years down the line it it's it's more than a debate i think it's about uh, having a voice which is not uh, who has not lived your life so i would definitely want people who are way younger than i am teaching me things showing me things at the same time uh, uh, it is it's it's a mutual feeding off in the end it's not uh, it doesn't work one sided it's not about uh, who's older who's younger it's it's just about you have lived a different life i have lived a different life i can bring in this much you can bring in this much let's make a meal together so i would definitely want a opposing force but more than a debate i think again then again this debate is amazing it's not uh, to fight with each other but to just hear each other off uh so i think that uh, you know one skill that i think is really really important in generally everyone is independent thinking right so i believe that uh, everyone has the capacity for it very few people actually kind of use it so i would say that uh, you know uh, you're saying what, um, would you like to have this debate for 30 years down the line right i don't mind uh, what would you do so that this kind of debate is not necessary no whether it happens or doesn't happen is another uh, uh, issue right but what i am saying is that i believe that it is important to identify what your niche is identify the problem that you kind of want to work in and work there whether it does happen whether it doesn't happen is not a uh, in in your hands right i mean you have to identify what is a constant and available as a challenge to execute right okay. <coughs> 
<laughs> if if I am not on a ventilator or dead, God, these guys are supposed. To... <laughs> no, I I just wanted to. Uh, somebody talked about the fact that what do I actually learn from the younger generation? So uh, hopefully the war is over. I can talk about a bunch of things that I've actually learned from uh, people that I work with. One one is this. Uh, I think user empathy, uh, you know, I, I think this entire idea of being the user closer to the user age in one sense and the user domain and the things around helps quite a bit. Uh, in, you know, even if I refuse, I'm removed from the reality uh, in a lot of ways. So, so that's one thing that I've learned and, and I actually look at uh, the youngsters in, in my team to kind of bring that insights forward that helps. The second thing is, um, Ability to switch micro context faster. I mean, uh, you know, we, you know, a little bit, little, a few, uh, an hour back probably, I talked about this entire idea of being deep and buried in the context, and that's a problem too. You know, nowadays it looks, you actually, especially in interaction design and UX, you constantly are looking for intent and ability to switch micro context very quickly, and it comes naturally for, for, for them than me, in, in one sense. That's a great, learning and then the last point is uh, least amount of emotional connect with work uh, in the sense uh, you know, which is good I'm saying it as a positive point uh, in 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 at that point of time when I was growing up especially out of college and working I used to cry if the client didn't like my logo or you know a brochure or a design that doesn't happen anymore which is great that is kind of is the democratization honestly of, of design because you actually know how, whether it's solving the problem or not, and there are so many options that solve the problem, and you know you can switch, which we thought it was horrible client, and you know, so. And, and thank you guys for, for that, yeah. So, um, uh, uh, I kind of brought this up uh, earlier, right? And uh, I think, you know, one thing that uh, you, like, in at any point in time that, you know, help is asked, right? Or advice is asked, or wisdom is asked for. It's always been delivered. Okay? And it's been delivered in very good time, and it's been very good advice, right? Like, so things that you can actually kind of live by, work by. And, uh, so, um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes that this, uh, the, the cost of an honest opinion is something that you don't typically understand is kind of invaluable. Sure. And uh, we don't really sometimes get it from our own generation because your friends are going to say, oh, nice logo, da. <laughs> right? But, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes you do need that and uh, uh, I think you do get, uh, we, we do get it from that side of the table. Excellent. All right. Uh, before we wrap up, any more points? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So just a small point which I can, I think, I was listening to both the views, uh, but I believe one point which needs little emphasis is on the business need to support this whole design society. In the sense, if some comments came, it said that today's work, lots of crappy, crappy work is happening because I think it's more to do with the drive. The piece of the artifact need to be created. What is the relevance in the real field is? If some brands comes, I need a brochure tomorrow in the morning for the newspaper, you're not going to get an instant idea how do you want to do it. The moment of need and ask is get it done the way you want it. So the whole idea of going Googling and replicating, making relevant comes picture. But if you have to do that for the Audi or maybe some Mercedes brand, they, they probably come to it 15 days back and say, think about it. I really want it a unique which can stick with the users and really stick hard. So I think whole business society has to support them in some way. I don't know how that can practically be happen because business is so dynamic, but somehow that need to be inculcated and to the people that to make them understand that design thoughts or the uniqueness will not come instantly. That requires some time and leave the people in isolation. Let them go around and think what new can we be. And then we can see the more new marvels to come at. So this is a viewpoint. I think business also had to somehow find a way to support the designing society to bring really good things out. So that's one thing. So I don't think you'll find anybody disagreeing with that. Yes? Yeah, if I may add, uh, I feel like we all see that this context uh, of business context is changing constantly. The way clients, um, sorry, 
uh, yeah, the way clients, the client's expectation, the timeline, the the, del the output that's required and whatever uh, is constantly changing and there is a speeding up that's happening. Um, so I think uh, maybe one of the questions we need to ask ourselves going forward, um, what does it mean to be a designer? What is a designer in today's context? Are our processes relevant in the context and are they adapting as you know the world around us is changing? And what do we hold dear and like never let go of, you know? And what is what is that uh, which will always stay true? So I think that's something we all may need to figure out. Yeah. I think what we all need to figure out now, you know, is the purpose exactly. Okay, it's okay. Like you know, you're actually consuming so much of data. You're getting inspired. Like you know, obviously there are so many things from people, from you know, incidences, from so many different situations. But why exactly, as Nidhi said, why exactly are you doing it? What's the purpose of your design? Why, where exactly do you want you know, this design to do? Basically, what problem do you want to solve it? Also, the business thing, well, this gentleman just mentioned that you know, business people need to understand. But do you really think if actually, if, see, I'm a business person. Business person. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so if we give you 15 days, do you really think that you are going to take, you know, find inspiration? There is, it's not time bound. That's the thing, you know, I really wanted to mention it here. If you really, you know, want to find inspiration, your life, you know, make your life as the inspiration. You can find it in five minutes, or you may not be able to find it in five years also. So exactly, and as Nidhi, you know, said that, you know, we should not be doing, you know, all these social responsibility projects as the sideline track. No. If we can actually, if, we re if you really want to make a mark in the society, why don't you just involve whatever you want to do in your mainstream? You know, just change the tonality, change the tone and voice of your communication in the design. So, yeah. Well, now I feel that we should have had another couple of hours. Some new sort of set of questions that we must. You can actually bring them here. Absolutely. Well, I hope somebody noted the questions down too. Uh, but I think we have run out of time, and I'd like to sort of give everybody a round of applause for participating. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for yes. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming down here on a Saturday. We consciously keeping uh, keep it on a Saturday in the middle of the city so that you can actually plan uh, the rest of the evening around the weekend. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is something we uh, we actually realize that uh, designers, you know, we have a lot of these conversations, a lot of these kind of uh, social uh, get-togethers in very small kind of uh, uh, groups that actually happen across. We are supposed to be the most social of the lot uh, as compared to many other industries or uh, disciplines. So we want to make this more like a habit. So we hope to see uh, many other faces over here on a frequent basis. Uh, we plan to have a mixer next month. Uh, we'll be announcing uh, the day and time and the location very soon on social media. Um, then we will be having uh, more debates, more workshops, more talks. So the idea is to actually make this a habit and probably once a year uh, have one grand festival of sorts that uh, Bangalore uh, can be proud of. Uh, Make. So we have this long-going battle with uh, the rest of India that uh, design the capital of such is they belong to Bangalore. So we have a battle going on. We want everybody to join uh, in this entire crusade that, as a Bangalore chapter, we have set out to do. So uh, thanks, Adam. Thanks to the panelists. We have a small token of appreciation. Shubhangi, if you can. and the snacks for the war to actually go on. We hope to have more such uh, debates and wars happening, so stay tuned to that. Um, I, I would also kind of like to thank all the volunteers who put this uh, show together. Um, Marty, Harsha, Vinay, Sima, Vinay, Thank you very much. 
another earnest uh, uh, request is that uh, unfortunately we are not at the website otherwise you would have said just click uh, like subscribe to uh, our social media channels so that we can actually stay connected to all of you in some form or the other uh, <coughs> If we email you, it's probably going to land in scam. Uh, spam, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, uh, we have, uh, the next month, we have the Pune Design Festival, 16th, 17th uh, in February. So, if you guys should check out the agenda for that. That's going to be uh, a kind of uh, um, the epic event happening in design in uh, Bangalore, uh, in, in India, you could say, uh, until Bangalore steps up and we create a bigger <laughs> event. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, over to Buffy and the rest of the conversation, rest of the debate. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, guys, could we just uh, have all you guys just hold us for a minute? We'll take a quick photo with everybody.